Do I look like the tropical fruit from the country I come from? Is it now? <laughs> People on the other side of the camera, if you exist? Yeah. <laughs> Does it look like that? <laughs> Director's fault. My friend actually exists. She's sitting right over there, by the way. The viewers might just question themselves, like, oh my god, are we actually watching that? Or are we imaginary now? You, you can speak so that I don't look like I'm talking to myself. I thought you want to talk to yourself. <laughs> she was going she she just sat in the bedroom she closed her ears and she said mommy please tell them to go away I cannot stand and I never seen her like that well, I remember she started screaming and she said someone's outside the house and I thought there were thieves or some you know you know gangsters or something out of the house and I was like what is she saying and then she's like close the windows close the windows and I closed all the windows and then I say who are they because nobody was in the house nobody was outside the house so no, mommy, they, they are just making so much of noise, tell them to go away, tell them to go away. Her, her symptoms were fairly severe, or I would say very severe, because she had all the hallmarks of schizophrenia. She had delusions, she had hallucinations, she had suspiciousness. She was acting out on it.
I had moments where I would scream and um, my dad would run and, and I would say I'm hurt and they hurt me and, my, and I would literally feel the pain and he's like why are you hurt because they kicked me you know um, and I, they feel I'm a piece of shit and things like that so those were the voices those were the controlling voices where um, I wouldn't I would want to watch something else on TV and I was told to watch something else which is, you know, I'm not the sort of the person who likes to be controlled, as you can see. You know, I'm quite, I'm very, very rebellious and open, opinionated about things. So for me, it was just messing around with this entire race, me, as a person, you know. We felt very weak. We felt very weak and we didn't know what to do. I remember in deep in my heart I said no. There, there will be a way that she will come out. All of us got involved. My youngest girl, who was I think about uh, 12 years old at that time, my wife and I. It was very difficult for me to accept what she was going through. And you know, I remember, you know, I always had to follow her to the shops later because, you know, something, my dad would always be like, you know, follow her, follow her. It's difficult. It's difficult to constantly have to deal with shuffling between mixing realities. I think, you know, my friends who probably are on drugs or do a bit of dope would understand that. Over here, I just don't need anyone of that. You know, hallucinations fukar me milta hai. That's what I say. <laughs> so it's it's about learning to, you know, uh, just live with them. I think she was holding a knife, right? Were you? I, I don't remember. She was holding something in her hand. And she wanted to, I think, either poke me or the father. I don't know what. And then I was wondering, you know, what's going on? And my dad held her and she started crying. And. I, I just didn't know what was going on and I was like totally lost. Then her father also kept on, you know, trying to grab the knife from her and she, she was poking the whole divan mattress. So my husband just pulled me and he said, let her do. At least she will come out uh, from that. And then when she calmed down slowly, my husband went and, to her and took the knife away. When she would just text saying, I, this is it. I'm giving up on life. I'm, I want to die just now. Then I didn't. That was that was really difficult to handle and be with her throughout till she was back to a normal. And this was all through messages because she would refuse to answer her calls. It screwed me up big time. It really screwed me up. The brain was not functioning at the level I knew before. It was just yes, no, uh, yes, no, kind of a thing. She was a person you could talk to, but she would answer, but there was no response. She would just say it because, okay, yes, this is the right thing to say. So she was saying it, but to actually voice her opinion, that was not there.
from being this completely hyperactive individual who would like you know swim and uh, you know in, get involved in martial arts and dance constantly and all of that being just taken away from you it was literally just and you just feel like a goddamn vegetable i mean when she's on med she is someone i can't i mean can't put the name and the face and the person together at all And just giving her medications was not enough. It was just like giving medications and waiting for a miracle. We'll get our child back. Two doses, my headache will go away. That was not the answer. We were waiting and waiting and nothing was happening. So finally we decided that we will look at other options. All right, And these are all the other options. Counseling helped and all her activities in uh, her art therapy. I got for her yoga teacher coming to the house. And then she, the yoga teacher also helped her to come out from her depression, her anxiety, and her, because of the side effect of the medicines. Our model is all models. We will not stick to just one. And there are so many avenues available, just why take one road? Patients have their own ideas as to why they developed a particular illness. It's very convenient and easy for doctors to discard patients' ideas of how and why they got ill and sort of impose or transplant our medical model onto them and then expect them to stick to what we say. It becomes difficult. If someone believes in some cultural things, if someone believes that the illness they have has been caused by some external powers, even if we don't always agree with them, if we write that idea off, it's highly unlikely that they would continue a therapeutic relationship with us. So my personal thing is that even if patients tell me something that I don't necessarily agree, I ask them to go ahead with what they think would help them as long as they do advise, as long as they do take sort of, sounds big, my, my advice as well, because both of it working together helps sort of get them uh, better, quicker and faster. Dr. Arvind treated me as an individual, not just a schizophrenic. Uh, he could treat me as a person. That is why we value and love our psychiatrist so much. He's been a godsend for us. And uh, I wish all psychiatrists do this. In his case, he spends a good one hour with us. 
Let me see him. I I hear that other psychiatrists spend just five minutes and they say, what was your earlier dosage? Now increase the dosage, decrease the dosage. Bye bye. When you are crazy in the head, you have no one to talk to. The only person you confide in happens to be the doctor and he gives you just five minutes of goddamn time. How is that going to make you feel? I mean, trust me, just having someone listen to you is the very first step. Unless you have this confidence that whatever I've got to say, the next person is going to be non-judgmental in hearing me out rather than, okay, you have hallucinations, you take this medication or you feel low, take antidepressants, then what, whatever the experience the patient has to share with you, it's lost and it becomes a mechanical vending machine kind of psychiatry. That rarely helps or that, that doesn't help. So rapport is of utmost importance in, in managing any any psychological problem, I would say. All books are set for. Even fiction is set. It takes you out for a few minutes. So we have something called inspiration. Written inspiration, there are books which belong to a separate category. When we started going to support groups, realizing what this illness was and having books available, my parents would buy them and just keep them. I would find the book lying around and uh, just pick it up and read it. Then it started making sense to me. And because of the voices, it's difficult to be listening to someone else. But having the visual right in front of me, I could keep going back to it over and over again. And I would read the same book a zillion times or on the same page until it would sink in. It. And I would say that, oh, hey, this is exactly what's going on with me. She said that, why don't you just talk to them and see what they want? You know, because if, you're going to, if they're going to follow you around, then just ask them, what is it? You know, and just talk to them, make them your friends. And that was probably what got me ticking. I started befriending these voices. Rather than calling that, that voice coming out from there, if she gives it a name and says, Stephen is talking to me. So it becomes very personal and it becomes easy for her to deal with it. In schizophrenia, the cure is not aimed at getting rid of all the symptoms. As I said, if the person is able to achieve their potential, even if they have sort of some voices, some delusional ideas, but if they can live with them, as in if they are able to cope with them, if they understand these are voices, these are hallucinations, if they understand they are part of their illness process, that makes it easy for them not to act on it. So they are able to sort of compartmentalize their, uh, this psychotic experience keep it aside and function normally in the society. They play a huge role in who I am today. And there are issues, there are days when I'm down where they do get the better of me. People talk about mind games. This is it. Uh, not about mind games with other people, but mind games with yourself. It's 
a manipulation of your own self over here. And I think we all do that. It was because of the voices that I started to paint. Colors started flowing in my life. The very voices um, that were controlling me, controlled my painting also, controlled my artwork, was helping me at the same time. What happened at action level of cutting myself, action level of taking that knife and you know trying to kill my parents or um, you know action level of wanting to run away slowly transformed onto paper as action but it's action on paper now you know. She's been able to express her symptoms through her art and through her paintings and that has been a good cathartic experience for Reshma. That's important, that's important that um, we are just not surrounded by the service providers, the psychiatrists, the counsellors, the parents, but we're also surrounded by people who knew us before, friends who knew us, who we did trust and they would remind us that you were like this before anyway, so why do you think it's a symptom? That this is where your self-talk happens. You question yourself that, oh no, she said it's fine. You know, why are my parents saying any different? It's not that I'm trying to blame parents over here because, you know, they guys, <laughs> you know, they've been seeing it for years. So eventually they also need to, re need to rehabilitate themselves. They need to go out. And I keep telling them, please go out and hang around. You guys haven't done it for five years with being with me. Please see that I have similar problems. That with these friends, you know, other parents are having similar problems with other 30 year old daughters, and then it gets them thinking that, hey, yeah, you know, I think we need to pass through this, you know, schizophrenia. <laughs> And I would say that's a very spiritual part. I mean, I started reading up, started talking to a lot of different um, spiritualists or people who believe in other sorts of worlds or realities or explanations for things that science cannot still answer. I don't disregard science. My dad's a scientist, you know, uh, but then why haven't you answered my story over here. Why is it that you know, these are issues that you cannot answer? There's no cause, you say. There's no cause for such things. There's, they say there's so many causes, fine, acceptable. There's no cure. Uh, but there's a different way of doing things. You can take medications. Why isn't there a cure then if you think science can answer all of this? Um, I have nothing against it, but then that there's a time that comes, I'm a very impatient person, I need my answers. I am not going to wait for it to happen. I'm not going to wait until science comes up, science comes up with some answer to it. Yeah, and I will do this, you'll be all fine. 
hello, I'll be like 50 with white hair, I'll actually start looking old, <laughs> you know, I can't wait, I want to enjoy life, I want my Ferrari, I want to do stuff, I want to go out there and do stuff, don't want to be sitting here taking meds until you guys come up with some answer, you know, no, it, that, that isn't me. I speak for myself over here. I have not, thankfully, I went through that stage of seven medications twice. You know, and it came down to maintenance before I developed mood swings again. And uh, like my parents do believe that I've always been a fighter. I will not confirm. I will never confirm to something if I'm not okay with it. I've always been so-called impulsive about things. I'll only do it if I feel like it. And it was the same thing. I'll take my pill if I feel like it. I have nothing against medications. They do work at a certain extent. They do work. We do need it. I'm not against that. But there's a point that comes where I know I cannot have I cannot ask myself, how long am I going to be dependent on the meds? Yes, it did make me uneasy when she said that she did not want medication. And if I remember correctly, I think after stopping the medicines within the first couple of months, she did become unwell. And my natural instinct was to put her back on medicines. She was dead against it. And I can say that she was right, maybe. Because, yes, with medication, I may have been able to control her symptoms quicker. But, yeah, she took a bit of time, but she reached there. So that sort of made me think that are the medicines always needed? And are they always needed according to the so-called protocols that we have? Because now in medicines, everything has protocols and everything has a sort of decision-making tree. But that does not take into account the person, the individual we are dealing with. And if she does want to go, what is it we can do to stop her from going? Shall we call the police and say that our child is not well and tell them to lock her up? No, we will not accept those things. I think that is worse than going sending the child to prison. Right? We say, look, she is all right. She will go. She will come back. Maybe she'll hurt us a lot in the process. No, we can stand it. And I think many parents can't do that. All right, uh, number one, having to deal uh, with those years of the illness and then, then getting thrown out in the real world was a big benefit. Because, number, because when you already have an illness, most users, I would say, most survivors, people living with an illness like this, 
are not allowed to go out in the real world. And then it's a contradiction. How do you live in a real world when it's close to you? see Confucius this is the um, how how do you develop those skills how do you socialize how do I talk to another normal person who is not going to understand what I'm saying when you just keep me away from them we are always kept in our comfort zones with people who understand what we're going through people who know who we are people who will protect us who will stand up for us there was being the rebellious person again. No, no, no. I want to go out there. I want to go to this place. I want to do this, you know. And nobody knew anything about me. So my complete band aid was actually removed. My wounds were open. You know, I didn't have my parents. I didn't have my support system. I didn't have my doctors. I didn't have anyone at that point. And I was, ha I was having to deal with the illness bit and facing the real world. Because you get so used to people saying that, no, she's just doing it out of a symptom. Maybe she's hearing voices and she wants to go for a walk. Deep inside, I'm dying to open my mouth and say, no, I just want to go for a walk. It's not the voices, you know. But you just don't. Something doesn't allow you to say that. But when you go out and you hang around with normal friends, you realize that you can do that. I mean, you can do that. You were doing that before. So just go. I show my parents, hey, you know what, I just want to go for a walk alone because I want to be alone. I mean, I'm like, I'm 30, you know, I want to just be alone. What's wrong with that? It's got nothing to do with me wanting to be with my, you know, unreal friends or hang out with my symptoms. You know, <laughs> I'm normal, you know. This is a very normal bit. And that helped me tell them that. Then they realized my parents, I mean, you know, having the same gene trait, I was obviously going to think the same way. So they realized, yeah, there's nothing wrong, actually. You know, when I would, there were times I used to get so angry out of frustration, built up frustration, that I would eventually it becomes into a psychosis or a paranoia that I would lash out there at them and say the most insane things. But that's just a build up of anger. And, um, you know, then they would say that no, that's a symptom. She's being psychotic again, you know, she's having the anger issues, you know. And then after I know, I was like, I'm a human being, I'm allowed to get angry, hello. You know, I could be having my jumps. I mean, come on, give me the benefit of the doubt, will you? I mean, I mean forget even being normal or not. I mean, even normal people go through that, you know, like where you not give the other person the benefit of the doubt. So over here, when you already have a separate reality to deal with, and everything we do, oh, she's having her symptoms. Oh, she's having a symptom, that's why she said that. I was like, no, I actually meant that. I actually did mean that I want to go and do something crazy to my hair. You know, it's got nothing to do with my symptom. You know, she behaves in these ways and she cuts her jeans and I was like, no. I think it's cool to cut my jeans and to have paint all over it. It's creative. It's not a symptom. That's where it gets so overwhelming that we end up forgetting the individual, the person. That, you know what, Raish, this is her personality. She will beat the crap out of you. She doesn't need to be psycho for that. <laughs> you know, and my friends who are normal reminded me, they're like, Raish, you will crazy before already. Uh, having gone through so much, I think uh, I would not say that these are of no value. I think they are more value to uh, in strengthening your own resolve. That's all. That means the caregivers, not the patient. Like you guys are my green dog. My dad suffered with short-term memory loss. Gave me the guidance, you know. They said that, okay, she cannot do because she's not in that state of mind. Yeah, so do you want to eat through mm -hmm. the camera? <laughs> good, thank you. <laughs> we're told that, you know, why we can't deal with stress, we'll be triggered off. 
Yes, we'll be triggered off. My question is who is not? Which one of you do not encounter problems? All my friends who are normal have problems. They get thrown into a pool of shark every day also. I mean, so, does that mean you're never going to show me that pool of shark? You're never going to allow me to swim? You're never going to let me touch water? I mean, unacceptable to me. Just not. one and I believe everybody else can be the lucky one if only the people around them are willing to give them that space. <laughs>